Hello there, friends. Welcome back. I have our trusty brush today that I've used as a pointer in many videos now. I was really in the mood to do some pointing and tracing today as well as page turning. So all I needed to accomplish that simple goal is my trusty pointer brush and something to point at. So I've got uh, an interesting artifact for us to take a look at today. slightly on this one, but, but I'll explain why as we go along. What we're going to look at today and point at and trace is, as you can see, the March 2280 edition of a naval industry journal called Starship Design Interstellar Forum for Naval Power. So, of course, this isn't really a journal from the future. But you probably realize right away that it is a bit of fan-generated material for Star Trek. You probably recognize that from the diagram here. I was a Star Trek fan growing up, and as I was growing up in the 70s, the local television station where I lived would show an episode of the original series in the afternoons shortly after I got home from school. So it was one of my traditions to watch an episode of Star Trek right after school. And I was already a bit of a technically minded kid when I was a teen. I liked my I liked my physics class in high school and I had the uh, unattractive glasses and a rather uh, 
arm's length relationship with girls. So I guess I was pretty stereotypically uh, nerdy back then. But one thing about TV shows and movies that are very inspiring and that generate a cult following is that they inspire the more creative um, people in that fandom to start generating fanfic and additions to the fandom of their own. This has happened for a long, long time, of course. There are tons of fan fiction being generated right now for countless TVs and movies that inspire imaginations to put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and start uh, writing additional adventures for their favorite characters. Star Trek was no different, of course, but Star Trek being science fiction, it had a fairly technological element to the show as well as most hard science fiction shows do. And so for kids like me who were already leaning in a little bit of a technical direction, the technology of a show like Star Trek was just as inspiring as the story elements were. And while I might be inspired to doodle something like a, uh, a fancy starship design on a napkin after seeing an episode back in those days, there were other people who took that sort of thing much farther. In addition to fiction, there were plenty of people in the 80s that started generating technical information, taking the technology of the show and expanding on it and playing out lots of what-ifs, taking what they saw presented to them in the show and asking what might other ships in the fleet look like and what might some of the other technology behind the scenes look like. And by the mid-80s, there were a collection of companies that had sprung up to meet this kind of a demand. Names like Star Station Aurora and the Starfleet Printing Office and Mastercom Data Center. And I started getting on mailing lists for things like this in my late high school years and just after And I collected a handful of the items that were being made in those days, and this is one of them. So we talk about imagination prompts on this channel, and Star Trek was a powerful 
imagination prompt for so many of us. And for me, being just a, a high school kid with a, with a love of science, it was truly amazing to see people years older than me who had more technical engineering understanding and more drafting expertise taking their inspiration that they were getting from the show and turning it into things like this. So I thought it would be fun. This little magazine isn't very long. I thought it would be fun to take our pointer and point and trace the various things that are in this fictional naval journal from the Star Trek universe and uh, ramble about how the show clearly inspired these folks and how it might have inspired all of us in different ways. Now, this publication came out in the mid-80s after the uh, Star Trek movie franchise had begun. Star Trek The Motion Picture came out in 1979, and the second movie, Wrath of Khan, came out in 82. And you might remember that in the movies, they took the opportunity to revamp the design of all of the ships. And what we can see here on the front cover before we even open up the journal is a bit of a celebration or a comparison of the old ship designs and the new ship designs. This drawing on the left would be very typical of a design from the original series. This would have been the Enterprise the way it looked then. And on the right is the redesign for the movies. And I have to imagine that if you were one of the people generating material like this in the, uh, in the mid eighties, that the redesigns that they did for the movies must have been quite uh, an embarrassment of riches for you because then you got to synthesize both the old and the new mixing and matching the various parts to come up with even more ship designs and you could do them in old style or new style. It must have been a great time to be inspired by Star Trek in this way. But creative projects like this not only gave you the chance to play around with your own ship designs, but there are articles in here too that gave you the opportunity to expand the universe, the non-canon universe of Star Trek by perhaps taking your own experience with either engineering companies or service in the military and applying them to Star Trek. For example, the journal we're going to trace through today has articles such as Kateremni, Examination of a New Destroyer recently put into space by the Klingon Imperial Fleet. 
the MK-20 program, a cruiser-class starship designed to become the workhorse of the fleet. And the USS Menaga. Can this ship and her proposed sisters fill the battle cruiser role? Very timely and important topics if you were following the, the business of Starfleet in the year 2280, I'm sure. So let's take a look. This journal has a uh, kind of a thin card stock cover. All of the stock is rather shiny. from Rakuv sensor and fire control systems. This is your sensor with Konus. This is your sensor without Konus. Tracking positive coordinates display Number seven units, identity, Klingon. I love so many things about just this one page. I love people coming up with advertisements, first of all, that would be targeted to the military industry or the, or the shipbuilder of the day. But I also love that this, this mimics real-world military applications. There, there's a system that I'm involved with, with my work, that declutters inputs that come in from multiple data links on an aircraft. So if you've got more than one data link and they're all feeding the location of a friendly airplane or a non-friendly airplane to your display, that could result in multiple icons, multiple instances of the same aircraft, and that could cause confusion. Decluttering multiple data links is a key step in making sure the pilot's situational awareness is clear and unconfused. And I love that that's exactly what, I mean, in this case, they're not, they're probably not decluttering multiple occurrences of the same ships, but they're showing that, you know, you can have a very confused picture or you can have a very clear picture that makes it easier to see where the bad Klingons are. And, and I love that there's, this is so much like the real world. We were talking about that kind of before and after diagram on the front cover. After the successful conversion of the Constitution class heavy cruisers to new technology standards, Starfleet headed full steam into a similar program with the Dreadnought fleet. 
After several years of operation, the gamble appears to have paid off. They're, and they're talking about the redesigns that came with the movies. Constitution class was the class of ship that the Enterprise belonged to in the original series. And then with the redesign for the movies, the class was renamed the Enterprise class. And I apologize, I'm not going to read every word of this, but uh, we'll be tracing some starships soon, but I just wanted to uh, point that out. So I mentioned before, Star Station Aurora was one of those companies that was doing stuff like this back in the 80s. And uh, if you were in the fandom back then and were buying blueprints and technical fan-generated items, you see this fellow's name a lot, Todd Gunther. He was one of the guys that was doing that a lot. Here's some editorial or some letters from readers. Here's a presumed letter from a Captain D.G. Tov, Starfleet Operating Forces. I must disagree with Commander Ambergris' comments regarding the Constitution II, Tikopai, and Enterprise-class heavy cruisers. I love this. So here's the article from the front cover about the MK-20 program, a shipbuilding status report. And here we have a great example of the kind of technical fan-generated material that people were creating back then and still and still create of course probably even more so now but I don't really follow that sort of thing anymore this is the Decatur Belknap class of cruiser and the one pictured is the NCC 2501 can see that this is in the the new design style from the movies with the uh, new style warp nacelle this time attached to the bottom of the hull and they label various things like the reaction control thruster Formation light, hangar bay doors, of course, navigational dome, the registration number. There's a phaser bank and another. And they give technical characteristics, length, beam, draft, and tonnage. They use nautical ship building terms for all of this stuff. You can see what they've decided to do here is use ship design from the original series as concept and then use ship design style from the movies for operational configurations. So this is the Decatur again, saying that this was the Decatur concept, the Decatur prototype. The 
I've got a note here about this checkerboard pattern at the back end of the warp nacelle. Checkerboard pattern indicating experimental vessel. And then decatur operational. Very much in the Star Trek movies style. I love how they can basically make up anything they want when you're doing this kind of, it's like, like I said, it's just a, it's fanfic, but with a highly technical bent. All Decatur Belknap class cruisers are being fitted with the Cetus weapon system. This system in conjunction with the Takar Fire Control Unit will significantly enhance the MK-20's offensive capability. <laughs> That's just them imagining. This is all imagination made solid into words and pictures. Star Trek was a very inspiring show. The Decatur Belknap Cruiser class here are all of the proposed cruisers they were going to build. All their hull numbers. Who the builders were. Date they were laid down, date launched, and date commissioned. You can see that as of this writing, they weren't done yet. And here we have the top plan and the port elevation of the ship we know and love, NCC-1701. This is Enterprise class heavy cruiser, so this would have been from the movies in that obvious style. So many of our favorite captains leading the 1701 into adventures for so many decades. So these pages are comparing the Enterprise class heavy cruiser with the Belknap class cruiser. We can see that they're very similar in length. You can see that the cruiser has a slightly smaller secondary hull than the heavy cruiser does. And don't, if those of you who are hardcore fans, please don't uh, please don't correct me too harshly if I uh, get some of these references wrong. I don't really I don't really operate in these circles anymore. A lot of this is from, you know, very, very rusty uh, memory, but, but I think, I think this part of the ship is called the primary hull and this part down here is the secondary hull. But if I'm wrong, my apologies. Uh, here we have the, uh, Comparison from the uh, starboard side. These are the port elevations. These are the starboard elevations. You don't really need both, frankly, since they're, the ships really look the same 
in profile. But again, comparing the Enterprise class to the Belknap class. They're continuing their, their fanfic article describing the, the class Equipment Procurement Operating Reports, Weapon Systems Comparative Data. And here we have a perspective visual of the Belknap class Warp Engine Support pylon assembly. This is the style that attaches to the bottom of the uh, secondary hull and I, I suppose is detachable. Perhaps there, there's a design advantage to being able to detach all of your warp nacelles. Yes, they call this routine detachable Disengage by blowing explosive bolts at the bottom of the secondary hull. Hey, I think I got the primary secondary hull thing right. Yay me. Now this is class information on dreadnoughts. I think we have more information about them later. You can see in officers and crew down here at the bottom. You can see that the uh, Komsomolsk dreadnought is the largest. At least with the highest complement of officers and crew. Here's that routine detachable pylon assembly we saw before. The more traditional style that we're used to. And then uh, this uh, style that they say was used on the Federation class of dreadnoughts. I think we'll find out later that the one characteristic of the dreadnoughts is that they have three warp nacelles and not just two, so some of these designs are probably to accommodate the location of the third nacelle. Oh yeah, here we go. So this is the Federation class dreadnought in the original series design. This was not a ship that was ever shown on TV. This is Todd Gunther being inspired by Star Trek and seeing where his uh, imagination would go. Configuration as proposed configuration as built. One difference between this and, you know, a ship like the Enterprise, of course, is that uh, the ship has hangar bays in the front of the secondary hull rather than at the back. Then, of course, three nacelles rather than two. Also has both a front and rear sensor and deflector dish. Primary bridge. I wonder if there's a secondary bridge someplace. I wouldn't be surprised if they would put a secondary bridge in the 
in the secondary hull someplace in case of a separation, but who knows. Then here's the present configuration of the Federation class dreadnoughts. Now you see it here in the the movie style. And I don't actually remember if they showed any dreadnoughts on screen in any of the movies, maybe in the background or something, I don't know. Maybe uh, someone will chime in with the answer to that. This is the Federation class dreadnought and the Ascension class dreadnought. You can see that the Ascension uses the routine detachable pylon configuration for two of the three nacelles, whereas the Federation does not. We're already to the halfway point of our imaginary technical journal. Update file about dreadnoughts. Vessel information for the Federation class and the Ascension class, which we just looked at. They say here that the, the third class, the Komsomolsk, the construction had not yet been authorized, so they didn't exist yet. Now, when I was a kid and I first got this imaginative item in the mail. This was my favorite article. The New Klingon Destroyer. They're talking about a, a new Klingon ship that they made up called the Kateramni. And this article talks about it, compares it to the Katinga, which is the Klingon vessel redesigned for the movies, as well as the Knox class frigates, which is a, a made up, you know, Starfleet ship for the purposes of this discussion. The Kateramni is a long range battle cruiser. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. The Katinga was the battlecruiser. The Katermni is a destroyer. Should learn to read. And here we have it. The Katermni class Klingon destroyer, complete with Klingon symbology up here at the top. I was always a big fan of Klingon ship design anyway, so it was really entertaining to see where guys like Todd Gunther took their imaginations with the Klingon design lines in the, uh, in the mid-80s to create something like this. I just always thought this was a fantastic looking variation on the Klingon theme.
Love it. Love this design. Weaponry and defense. Katerimni is literally bristling with disruptor weapons, 10 individual mounts, as opposed to 8 on the Katingas. So here's a great comparison, and I can tell you the things that struck me then still strike me now in terms of comparing these designs. So the Katinga that we have on the bottom here is the redesigned Klingon ship that they used in the movies. The Katerimni is made up. But I loved the lower top to bottom profile here. Compared to the Katinga, the Katerimni looks so low and mean and sinister looking with a slimmer profile both here and here a lot less bulbous of a shape perhaps even more like a snake's head perhaps that was what I was struck by just a lean Sinister Machine was always a huge fan of this variation compared to what we saw on screen. I don't think this ever was realized in canon or, you know, in the show, but I would love to see it. Here's the bow elevation comparing the two. You can see how it sits so much lower compared to where the nacelles are in the Katerimni compared to the Katinga. Yes, this is Klingon warship ASMR we're doing right now. This is what we're doing. This you should recognize from the original series. They called this a Clolode class battle cruiser. The Katerimni is a further extension of the Raxor Clolode Katinga warship design. All are in service. Propulsion, hull, Form and warp ability, hangar facilities. And this article compares both of these Klingon ships to the Knox class frigate. So they include, they include a starboard elevation of the Knox here. NCC. 1940. If this general hull style looks familiar, you may be thinking of the ship that Khan stole in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. That was the USS Reliant and it was a, an Avenger class heavy frigate. This is the Knox class. Just regular frigate, but the saucer 
with two nacelles below design is the same for both. Department of the Fleet Shipbuilding and Conversion 2280 to 2284 And uh, we have all the various ship types on the left and quantities against years in the table, followed by an article titled Starfleet's Battle Cruiser? Question mark. Can Starfleet afford to invest in a fleet of ships which will probably sit around unused? And we're talking about the Monaga class here. And again, this is ripped from the headlines type stuff, right? Because anytime you poke into news articles about defense budgets and things. There are always stories of new aircraft, for example, that take a lot longer to build than planned, cost a lot more money than planned, and there's always the debate over you know, when do you pull the trigger on new types of aircraft versus continuing to maintain and improve and repair the aircraft that you already have? Budget considerations, congressional authorization. So you could probably replace Monaga with, you know, any number of real-world Defense Department projects and come up with an article that could have been written in modern times. And of course you would do that, right? If you were these guys back in the 80s and you wanted to make a, a journal, a military industry journal, you probably got some current journals from the 80s, right? And looked at what kind of articles would be uh, included and pattern your fan-generated material after that. So here we have the top plan and the port elevation of the Menaga class battlecruiser experimental prototype we don't even have to be big fans of Star Trek to see that in this design compared to designs we just saw earlier in this journal you can see that the nacelles are positioned a lot closer together here compared to the diameter of the primary hull than they are in other designs. And this design for the secondary hull is very odd. And then here we have an evaluation report submitted to Starfleet Command by Saestan, which I assume is a contractor that specializes in ship inspections. This is findings pursuant to structural, operational, and systems testing of 3100 series Monaga Starship class. 
And I'm, I won't read this, but I would assume that the evaluation report is not good. But we can just pick one. Location of aft phaser banks, two. I wonder if they have those. Phasers. Oh, here they are. This one and this one. Location of aft phaser banks, two, is inadequate. Phaser fire arc represents hazard to warp nacelles regardless of computer fire control. Recommend relocation. So they're saying they built a prototype of a ship where you could run the risk of blowing off your own warp nacelles with your aft phaser banks. There you go. And they continue on the uh, continue in the article with more criticism of the Monaga. And here we have a page. I just mentioned this ship, the Avenger class heavy frigate. They must mention the the Avenger class in this article here. Alternatives to the Monaga design are numerous, but the only one which seems to be receiving any serious consideration is a concept called Project Adrift. This plan would utilize the basic characteristics and dimensional ratios of Avenger class heavy frigates ADREFT is an acronym for Avenger Design Refit to form a somewhat larger vessel with greater firepower, equally impressive warp geometries, and definitive battlecruiser capabilities. I.e. the ability to move quickly into a battle situation engage enemy units without the assistance of support vessels, and remain on station for an extended length of time. And when you read these three traits of a battle cruiser, it makes one wonder if those are exactly the traits of a modern-day seafaring battle cruiser. So much of this would be mapped directly from modern-day naval ship requirements, I would assume. The Avenger-class heavy frigate. This is like the ship from Star Trek II. The Khan hijacked. Here's our starboard and port elevations of the Avenger class, again. Forward phasers, primary bridge. Plenty of things to point at on these pages. Impulse engines. Navigation light. And the magnetomic amplification crystal. I wonder if this is their equivalent of the flux capacitor from Back to the Future. One can only hope. It looks like this is meant to describe what that refit would be, the adrift refit perspective visual 
Avenger class warp engine weapons package. Avenger design refit. Weapons pod photon torpedo tubes. Uh, I love these. These are recognition silhouettes. You can find these today for aircraft and a variety of other things. I'm guessing there's a silhouette here for every ship they've talked about in this journal. There's the Monaga, a very distinctive secondary hull right here. Doesn't look like anything else. And the Katerimni, of course. My favorite. Oh, they have the they have the key down here. I wasn't reading the key, I promise. Got to get my nerd points. Here's another section that I am absolutely sure is ripped right out of modern journals. Ship service reunions. So if you served on the frigate USS Don Tuck or the transport USS Makassar Strait or the destroyer USS Petrikov, your reunions are coming up. And some general announcements. The 124th Tactical Combat Squadron, Starbase 27, has won an award. The Association of Military Surgeons of the Starfleet will hold its biennial convention coming up in August 2280. Make your uh, reservations now. Mama always told me not to look into the eyes of the sun. But Mama, that's where the fun is. Extra credit for anyone in the comments who can tell me what that reference is. Vickers Shipbuilding Limited. They've built all of these dreadnoughts, through deck cruisers, frigates, destroyers, scouts, transports, clippers plus 97 support vessels and 756 Liberty ships, all built with pride. And on the back cover, another advertisement for sensors. Sensor contact. 15 Mark 107.4 Range Almost 2 million kilometers Description Space Vessel Research, Development, and Production Capability Based on 130 years of experience Aristophus Zinn Defense and Space Systems Division
So, imagination. Things that prompt, things that jumpstart the imagination, and then what we do. Where we let the imagination take us from there. For me, being a kid and a Star Trek fan, I did nothing more than maybe doodle on some napkins and imagine in my head some alternate stories or some made-up adventures of my own. I was never a writer, so I didn't really write fan fiction of my own, but maybe I played out some of my own fan fiction in my head. And then there were people like this. They were able to take their real-world engineering, technical, drafting expertise, and those tools and those skills, along with their imagination, took them to places like this. And this kind of stuff was like a feedback loop for me, because when I got something like this in the mail, well, my mind just exploded, right? To, to see people who were able to take my very, very small little excursions and take them to this extreme and put it on paper and get it back out for other fans, well, it just, uh, it just blew me away. And by the time I was done, I had a cardboard box filled with blueprints and tech manuals, medical reference manuals, all sorts of this kind of stuff. And I still have that box today. In fact, it's in the garage. It's the box I just opened up to fish this thing out of it. You know, we talk about the gift that keeps on giving, but any imaginative storytelling keeps giving as we play it out in different variations and permutations in our minds. And in that regard, even if I may not follow the franchise anymore and, and haven't really for a long time, the seeds are all still there, aren't they? The, the ability to take a starting point and then imagine and extrapolate imaginary destinations from that seed, that starting point. I think that's, I think that's valuable. I think we can all do that to some degree. We can all do it more if we want to or give ourselves permission to. Anyway. I hope if you're a fan of pointing and tracing and a little bit of page turning, I hope you've enjoyed this video. And for that other group of people who are fans of Trek, I hope you uh, enjoyed the chance to uh, nerd out with me a little bit on this entertaining artifact from my teenage years. And as we finish tracing this title, 
I always wish you the best. Please take care of yourself. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.